and gentlemen, welcome to Marketing Monday on September 4th, 2023. This is a section of the show called Wins and Fails, where we go over all the wins and fails last week in marketing and business. And I want to start off with a win. A rare, <laughs> a rare Elon Musk win from this show. Now, usually I'm pretty critical of Elon Musk ever since he took over Twitter and piled on a bunch of debt and kind of ran into the ground. But I want to give an Elon Musk win because a recently released excerpt has been revealed from Walter Isaacson's new book about Elon Musk. And Elon Musk has never been more relatable to me in his entire life. <laughs> Elon Musk, pictured here, a noble hero in the world of Elden Ring. This is an excerpt from Walter Isaacson's new book. Let me walk you through it. You see, recently he revealed that Elon Musk, in a time of business stress, flew to Vancouver to meet his on and off girlfriend, Claire Boucher, AKA Grimes. She was pushing him to go there so she could introduce him and their son, who's named X, <laughs> to her parents and grandparents. Unfortunately, when it came time for him to actually meet her parents, she decided to leave him at the hotel because he was in quote, stress mode. <laughs> what did he do when he was in stress mode? He got into a new video game called Elden Ring that he had downloaded on his laptop. He spent a lot of time in the game's most dangerous regions, a fiery red hellscape known as Kaelid. <laughs> Instead of sleeping, he played until 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> well, it turns out the day he played Elden Ring till 5.30 in the morning, he tweeted this and officially made the offer to buy Twitter for 54.20 a share. <laughs> this is the day where the infamous 54.20 offer that cost him $40 billion to buy Twitter came from. And I have to tell you, I have never related to Elon Musk more. He stayed up all night playing a game, was mauled, and then made dumb decisions. Yes! Finally, I can relate to this fuck. What's interesting, there's a little bit more to this story, you see. Right after he tweeted out this offer, there was a little bit of pushback. This guy is Prince Alwaleed Talal, a multi-billionaire sitting on a golden throne who's also a Saudi Arabian prince. And he said, I don't believe the proposed offer by Elon Musk, 5420, comes close to the real value of Twitter, given its growth prospects, which is a gigantic joke. <laughs> it's, it's, it was so much more than Twitter was actually worth. But he said, I'm one of the largest and long-term shareholders. I reject this offer. And Elon Musk, hero of free speech that he is, actually pushed back, publicly said, hey, how much of Twitter does the kingdom own? And what are the kingdom's views on journalistic freedom of speech? Basically saying like, fuck you. <laughs> and people like this, this is pretty good. Now let's flash forward to 2023. I wanna talk about something entirely different, completely unrelated. This guy was just sentenced to death for his tweets. He has seven kids, he's a retired school teacher. He had an anonymous Twitter account that had 10 followers. He had a 10 follower anonymous account that basically said some parts of the Saudi Arabian government are corrupt. He retweeted some things, some political cartoons and stuff. He has now been sentenced to death and they don't even know how they found out who owned the account. The account was anonymous. How did they know how they were able to verify his identity? But it may have something to do with the fact that the number two owner of X.com right now is the Saudi Arabian government whose ownership has only increased. In fact, when Elon chose to spend the $40 billion to buy Twitter, a huge part of that was put up by the Saudi Arabian Sovereign Nelf National Wealth Fund. This is a tweet later from the same guy. Remember this, this is the back and forth. This guy tweeted again after the buyout and said, dear friend, chief twit Elon Musk, together all the way handshake. After Elon Musk tweeted, the bird is freed. They worked together to put together the money and billions needed to buy the company. Now you'd think, that a person getting murdered would cause some sort of pushback. After all, this is the guy who said he's a free speech absolutist. He vowed to pay the legal costs for anyone who gets in trouble at work for their tweets. But in fact, Elon Musk has apparently been completely silent. He has not spoken at all since the story came out and certainly not about this. And it seems to portray the fact that the business dealings, that he has to listen to what the Saudi Arabian government says, despite his so-called uh, free speech act loses them <laughs> is a problem. And that could be the case. It's possible. Or my theory. He's just staying up too late playing Starfield, bro. He's just grinding. 
He hasn't figured out this news because he's so busy grinding until 5 a.m., bro. He's got the grind set. <laughs> I'll leave that up to you to decide. Up to your media literacy. Speaking of media literacy, let's give a huge win to everyone in chat who is under eight months old. So 98% of you. <laughs> because of a new study, a new landmark study has found that screen time among one-year-olds is permanently linked to delayed development in babies. There's long-term effects on communication, fine motor skills, problem solving, personal and social skills. I'm sure this has no effect on anybody in their teens or adults. <laughs> it's only dumb babies. What's important and what makes this a huge win, they published a follow-up study. Unless it's Marketing Monday. You're fine. <laughs> so all of you who are eight months old, don't worry, you can still watch. Honestly, I looked into the study. There's two options. The screen time is causing it or the screen time is replacing other stuff that should be more helpful. For example, if a kid spends all the time on screens, the screens might not be doing anything wrong, but they're not getting the communication with, with other people or the time with the parents or whatever that could cause it. it. It could be just a replacement. That could be the case. I'm looking into it. I'll follow up on it because I find it interesting, but so far they don't know. That being said, Marketing Monday, 100% in the clear, guaranteed good for you at any age. Any plans for kids in the future? Yes, Ari and I have talked and we have decided that if we do have kids, we will make sure they watch screen time 100% of their waking hours so we can get a full case study. <laughs> Speaking of actual real news, let's jump over. This is an actual win. This is a study by the Wall Street Journal that looked into the actual numbers of workers striking every single year since the 1980s. And it turns out that as we approach the largest auto workers striker in like 30 years, the United Auto Workers Strike, if they do go on strike this month, which seems to be possible, this could be one of the largest strike years since the early 80s before basically Reagan crushed uh, unions and there's been a, a huge backlash. As you can see here, for most of your waking lives, 2000s, 2010s, we've had the lowest amount of strikes in American history. It's been a time of complete corporate consolidation, no labor pushback. The 2010s were absolutely terrible for it and we are finally seeing a pushback in the 2020s, which again, I think is an important part of a functioning democracy is a counterbalance between government has strength, corporations have strength, and labor has strength, and none of them gets too strong so they can abuse their power. Back in the 80s, again, pre-1985, we had massive strikes all the time in America. I want people to understand that, like, it's before you were born, but it's not that crazy. We had decades of strong labor in America, and it led to higher average wages, wages increasing with productivity, and most importantly, like, the average CEO was paid, like, 20 times what a worker's paid, and now it's, like, 300 plus. <laughs> All of the excess gains has gone to the very, very, very top of the corporation. And largely it's because of uh, decreased bargaining power from the average worker. And what I thought was most interesting about this is that surveys show that the average American is beginning to see labor unions as a positive thing. 67% of Americans now said they approve of labor unions. Again, a decade ago, it was 54%. And before that, it was even lower. This is a, it's, it's a strong positive sign that people see that bargaining together has a benefit. So I'm giving this a dub. I think this is pretty cool. I think this is a strong trend in the right direction. Though, I do think that rising unemployment could cause a real problem. Labor movements usually do well when there's low unemployment. Rising unemployment could have changed that. So I, I'm, I'm gonna keep an up on it, but this is an interesting thing. Speaking of labor unions and strikes and back and forth, I wanna give you a quick update on this guy, Father Death. <laughs> You probably have no idea who this guy is, and he probably freaks you out because he looks old enough to be fucking time himself. But his name is actually Barry Diller, and he's an old school uh, Hollywood mogul who is now retired. And he spoke quite honestly to a article with Hollywood Reporter. Basically, he said, if you guys don't know this, all of the studios, Disney, Netflix, Amazon, Apple, uh, Warner Brothers Discovery, they all organized together under a group called the AMPTP and they basically operate as a cartel where no one of them is allowed to break ranks and make a deal with the writers. They all have to work together so they can try to get the best deal for the studio heads. Now, the problem is them all working together is good for some of them, but not all. And some of their members are starting to get a little bit frustrated. The real winner of this strike is turning out to be Netflix because everyone else is gonna be running out of content, starting to see high churn, people unsubscribing, 
They're gonna have no movies for the theaters for the next year. Warner Brothers Discovery had Blue Beetle flop like crazy, had to push out Dune 2, and has like nothing left for the next year. They're freaking out. If they don't get a deal soon, they're, they're fucked. They have a ton of debt to pay. And Barry Diller is pointing out pretty intelligently, I think, that all these studios should start thinking about splitting out and leaving Netflix to not have a deal. Like they should just start talking to the writers and the actors directly and saying, hey, we'll make the deal, we need movies. Now, Netflix, Diller argued, was the architect of the strikes. And it is true. The stuff about like AI technology replacing actors and writers, the stuff about people not being paid for streaming residuals, all of that stuff is the main things that the writers are mad about. And guess who is the most hardcore against any progress in that front? It's Netflix. Warner Brothers doesn't really fucking care. <laughs> they just want to churn out more shit movies and try to survive, dude. This strike does one thing and one thing only. It strengthens Netflix and weakens the others. Now, the effects of this has not yet been felt. But as we approach 2024, a lot of these movie studios are going to be running out of stuff to publish. And that is going to hurt. And now they're going to start feeling the pain. Now, while Netflix has global networks of uh, studios, they make movie or shows in South Korea and Britain and other countries, everyone else is going to be in trouble. Speaking of Hollywood, I want to talk about the female Ben Shapiro. No, I'm sorry. I, don't, I think her name is a Brett Cooper. No, I don't know. Gwen Shapiro. I don't know. I actually don't know her name, but she is an icon here as she was pretty pissed about a Hollywood studio deciding to enforce a new mask mandate. And she dropped one of the greatest clips I've ever seen. Let's jump into it. Health and for our own good, of course. Lionsgate is the big one that's doing that. Hollywood bringing back mask mandates. Lionsgate Studios, which makes Saw and Hunger Games franchises, asks office staff to don face coverings and test again. You guys know what this means. 14 days, only 14. We're just precautionary. We have been there before. We know what that means. Two weeks to sell the spread. We've uh -huh. done that. We don't want to do it again. And of course, they're going to tell us that it's good for us. It's not good for you. What is actually good for you is a good rancher steak. That is what you should be eating. That is what you should be focusing on. And I'm not just talking about your health <laughs> financially good ranchers is the healthy option <laughs> now that's marketing mix it in with the news i want to be angry than hungry in the same sentence now that's a transition so i want to give that a win and speaking of transitions that it make no sense, let's talk about Taylor Swift and her domination of Hollywood. As you are now able to get the official Eras Tour popcorn bucket for $14.99 in theaters at 1013. The story here is actually kind of crazy. Taylor Swift has just completed a billion dollar plus concert tour around the world called the Eras Tour. I'm sorry, not completed, it's still going. And they are going to be showcasing a live footage of the concert tour in AMC theaters. Now, what's interesting about this Taylor Swift's power over music is not limited to just music because instantly this was available. As soon as it was available, the pre-sales have broken AMC's record. <laughs> the highest pre-sale of any movie tickets in AMC's 103 year history. <laughs> And what's extra interesting is, again, she continues to make kind of crazy uh, girl boss business mogul moves. This deal was negotiated by apparently cutting out the actual studios themselves and Taylor Swift and her team negotiated directly with the CEO of AMC. So they get 100% of the cut and are going to be uh, premiering this concert and I guess packing theaters. Actual movie studios are so scared of releasing their movie at the same time as a concert rebroadcast that they're moving their release date. <laughs> Exorcist Believer pushed its release date a week early to avoid releasing the same week as the Swifties film. That's crazy. I knew Taylor Swift was big. But until like the recent last month of seeing the Eras Tour numbers, I did not know how big Taylor Swift was. So anyway, interesting stuff there. Someone who doesn't have financial power, unfortunately, and I have to give a bit of a fail to, <laughs> FaZe Clan. Now we've talked about FaZe Clan before, but I wanna give a quick recap and then a big update. If you could just take a moment and phase up solemnly. I know all of us collectively believe that FaZe Clan was the greatest investment known to man, but it turns out that not only is it down, but it is officially flaming out on the NASDAQ, as in it's going to be delisted. There's a certain time period that your, your stock must not be below $1. If you're too long below $1, they just cut your stock from the from NASDAQ altogether. And that is now officially like 18 days from happening and seeming very likely that there is no bounce back. Unless we all collectively buy. If we all collectively dump our life savings into FaZe Clan stock, maybe we can pump it up. <laughs> this is a recent balance sheet report. We're gonna do a quick balance sheet reading here and just see if we can figure out why FaZe Clan stock seems to be continually dumping, all right? You'll notice in 2022, 
This is the amount of revenue they made, $34 million, pretty good. Their valuation when they went public was 750 million, so, and now it is under 20 million. So obviously 34 million is not that great, but it's, it's something, all right? Now in 2023, that is down to 24 million. They haven't grown in the past year. They've actually lost about a third of their value. They make $11 million less than they used to make. All right, whatever, you make a little less money. Then everything below the revenues line is costs. So you take all this and you subtract it from the revenue to find out what you actually made in terms of profit, okay? The main thing that increased was general and administrative costs. In 2022, they spent $21 million on this. Now this is things like paying for the phase clan building. This is things like paying expensive consultants to tell you good ideas. <laughs> this is things like extravagant work trips <laughs> and vacations. Now they spent $21 million on this last year. This year, that's up to 30 million. The value of the company right now is $20 million. So they are spending 10 million more than the entire value of the company <laughs> on this stuff. Now, last year, they lost about $18 million total. This year, they're already up to about 30 million in losses. So not only is revenue not increasing, but losses are accelerating dramatically. <laughs> this company does not generate any money and they spend it all on highly paid executives. The diminishing revenue and growing costs are hard for investors to overlook. So right now they have about $21 million in cash on hand left over. But basically on their balance sheet, they have $21 million left. That means the market is valuing phase the brand, phase the employees, phase the building, phase everything at zero dollars. <laughs> Actually negative one million dollars. <laughs> which means FaZe is almost certainly headed to a complete delisting and probably getting bought out. If I had to guess, probably somebody else coming in to buy the name. But at least they have their highly paid executives, right? Except for these guys, except for Amit Bejaj, their chief financial officer, who quit immediately after the company went public. He cashed out and quit. <laughs> and then of course they lost Ben Gordon, the head of corporate strategy and analytics. He quit almost immediately after. Then Derek Chestnut, head of consumer products, he quit. And then five more people, Xavier Ramos, the head of marketing, all of them just quit. What is that, nine people? And then 10 more. <laughs> and then most sadly of all, Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg quit in March 29th, 2023. It's not a good sign for FaZe. And I think all in all, this whole experiment of going public will have been a resounding disaster. I think they could have hid the fact they made no money for a much longer time if they didn't get greedy and try to go public. And investors still would have bought in to try and be part of the lifestyle. But I will say this, they did do one thing, which is pretty cool. They got Snoop Dogg to wear a FaZe Clan chain during the Super Bowl halftime performance. <laughs> and history will never take that away. <laughs> so I'll give them a dub. And I'll phase up to that, brother. You know what else is up? Probably due to Marketing Monday, a huge win to myself in this show. The number of graduates who are pursuing business, marketing, and related fields is the number one bachelor's degree in America right now. Up 7% since 2010. I'm sure entirely due. <laughs> It's a marketing Monday. Though actually business has always been the number one for at least as long as this survey has been uh, ran. And what's more interesting is the rapid growth in the number of students getting into health professions. Healthcare and related healthcare industries is up 87% is the fastest growing major among all students. Possibly because we're watching House MD. <laughs> Computer science is the single largest grower in the past 10 years. A ton of you are uh, computer science majors, and that's largely part of this rapid growth. People are trying to get into the tech fields. The biggest decliner in the past 10 years was English lit. English language and literature is down 32% and is a very uh, lowly pursued degree. And I will say, I looked into it because I saw the top of this and I was like, well, I get a lot of people that message me saying they went into marketing and they're enjoying it, but they're worried about getting a job if you're graduating. And I, I don't know. I mean, I think finding an entry level job in marketing is one of the most horrendous experiences you can go through. There's so many scam companies. There's so many jobs that are actually just sales that lie to you. I think it's a pain in the ass. I think marketing is a cool industry to be in, but you have to get some work under your belt. But I did find out advertising, public relations and related services is actually at all time highs in job availability. So cool stuff. I just thought I'd give a win to people that are pursuing this. Hope you find a job in it. Hope you enjoy it, but don't do it if you don't like it. That is the end of uh, minor related stories in this week's Marketing Monday, but I would not end a Marketing Monday without looking to the Far East. Wow. 
What's up, Beijing? What's up, Beijing? Thank you, Xi Jinping, for that introduction. Let's find out what's going on in the world of China. The Huawei Mate 60S phone, a $900 smartphone that was just released. This is a massive story and probably the biggest story out of China tech in a long time. You see, recently, about mm, a few years back, Biden put together some comprehensive tech blockade on high level chip making devices to China, basically trying to prevent them from being able to make the latest and greatest chips. And the story here that China would like to be telling is that this Huawei phone is proof that they've broken through the US sanctions and can now make their own seven nanometer chips. Chips are ranked basically based on the size of the chip. So the bigger the number, the worse the chip, the more slow, expensive, and power hungry it is. And for a long time, China could only make 14 nanometer chips. And it was thought that this tech blockade would stop them from being able to make seven nanometer ones, homegrown. Intel in America can make seven nanometer chips, but the best chips in the world are made in Lay's factory. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> no, in Taiwan and in Korea. Samsung and TSMC in Taiwan can make four nanometer and even coming close to three nanometer chips. Right now, the export controls on that stuff cannot go to China. But as far as we can tell, based on what China is announcing, it happened right as an American diplomat landed to meet with China. They surprised the same day that person landed, they released this phone proving they don't need to worry about the sanctions and they can make their own seven nanometer chip. So let's hear more about it from this video. An advanced processor to power its latest smartphone. It's a sign that Beijing is making early progress in a nationwide push to overcome US sanctions. I wanna pause real quick. You might think they would celebrate this. This is a huge breakthrough, but Huawei did no PR at all and in fact, on the box and all the press release did not even mention what kind of chip was in it. It's only been said afterwards by the Chinese government and by people that are doing a tech breakdown. So there's something suspicious going on. I, we don't know exactly where the source of these chips are. We don't know if some of them are stockpiled from before tech sanctions in 2021. Again, I'm gonna be fair here. And it looks like China has been able to create homegrown their own seven nanometer chips. So Huawei quietly dropped this phone last week into the market and it caused quite a stir, but there were a lot of questions about exactly what kind of tech technology was inside the phone. You'll also notice a near 20% gain in SMIC, that's uh, China's chip manufacturing company, stock. Again, this comes at a time when most stocks in China are taking a beating. So what we did is we bought one of the phones and then we worked with this firm, Tech Insights. And what they found was very, very interesting. They found that there is an advanced semiconductor uh, inside the phone that's made by SMIC. That's a Chinese uh, chip SMIC. making company that's not known to have these kinds of capabilities. They were able to produce a processor that was much more advanced than people had anticipated SMIC was actually capable of doing. So it's a sign of China's progress in getting around some of these US restrictions. If this is all true and they did create it, it is, it's a big moment for China. That being said, I've looked into it on a different level, which is that basically Intel has been stuck at seven nanometer for a very long time. <laughs> seven nanometer is seen as sort of the break point where it's very, very hard to go past that without the without some kind of like ultraviolet, super radi, I don't know, I, I, it's some kind of incredible system that you need to get down to the four and three nanometer level that right now only Samsung and TSMC have been able to do in the entire world. In all likelihood, it'll be very difficult for them to go at the next level, which is requiring them to leapfrog either Taiwan or South Korea, which is why Taiwan remains the most important country geopolitically kind of in the world right now, because they make all of the world's chips for cars, phones, uh, gaming consoles, computers, everything at the best level. So I'm personally of the opinion that like if China can make their own chips, it actually reduces the likelihood of war over Taiwan, which is a good thing. <laughs> So I wanted to give that update because this is a big, this is a big fucking deal. And again, China took this, took the moment to make a bunch of uh, political cartoons about it and really rub it in and make it, make it some sort of big thing all over um, social media. Chinese diplomats were posting all about it. Uh, though I will say this, I found was interesting. Do you remember this guy? This is Wang Yibo. He's a big Chinese uh, actor, superstar who starred in Born to Fly. He was the lead actor. He's my goat, dude. He was paid <laughs> to promote this phone, <laughs> the Redmi K30. And then recently while visiting LA, made a bit of an oopsie <laughs> and showed that he is actually an iPhone user. Caused a really big social media pushback, immediately deleted it. This mirrors what happened a while ago, a while back where a much more important person was caught using an iPhone, Xi Jinping's wife. <laughs>
Uh, she now, of course, is Huawei only, but that was, uh, yeah, look at his face, dude, he's not happy.